in so well to this series that we're in in the book of Ruth as we're talking about hope and and how we act in hope and you know I I put a, a, a little piece in the e-news this week if you saw it asking the question have you ever taken a risky step you know, have you ever been at that moment where you were pressed to have to kind of push out there and step out a little bit take some action do something you couldn't just sit back anymore you know if you hit that moment what was it that gave you the courage to get up and to move you know, was it hope about what was going to happen? Was it maybe just desperation of the moment something's got to change? You know, maybe it was a, a little mix of both. You know, I find that when, whenever we're comfortable, we sit pretty still, don't we? We really have to get uncomfortable to get out and do something. So I think that desperation's part of it as well as the hope that we have. But there are times when our situation calls for not only relying on God and praying to God for his provision and to do something, but that we actually get up and take a step of faith and do something. Put some feet to our faith. Act on what God has promised. But there is a difference between a desperation gambit when we try to manipulate circumstances for the, the outcome that we desire and a true step of faith. You know, I've heard for years about faith, foolishness, and presumption. You know, faith is what we want to operate in. We want to act as children of faith and, and faith in God and see God move in great ways. But there's also foolishness and presumption. And foolishness and presumption is when we're just out there on our own ideas and our own plans. And we're just, well, I'm just going to make it work, you know. And we presume that, well, if I step out here, surely God will rescue me in my, in my presumption, you know, or do something. So I want to talk to you about this idea of stepping out in faith. Because stepping out in faith is not so much about certainty regarding the outcome of the situation as it is our certainty of trust in the one into whose hands we are placing ourselves. And there's a significant distinction there. The trust, the submission, the obedience, you're going to hear me say that all the time. Why? Because that's the substance of this relationship that we got away from in a sinful nature and it's the relationship that God is calling us back to that we would walk in a relationship of trust submission and obedience to him and living life as his people and as his children and faith whatever the outcome you know when we take a step of faith whatever that outcome if we've given it to God we're trusting that it's going to be for the best like these songs we just sang today like Romans 8, 28 that we've looked at that says, you know, in all things, God works together for the good of those that love him. You know, all of our circumstances, all the broken pieces, he's at work to do that. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about what it is to take a step of faith and what that looks like and how do we know when it really is a step of faith. We're going back to Ruth chapter 3. I'm actually going to read this chapter in its entirety this morning as we get started. It's just a little segment of the story, 18 verses. It's kind of a midpoint in where we're at. But let's look at Ruth chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, One day Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you. Take a bath, put on perfume, and dress in your nicest clothes. Then go to the threshing floor, but don't let Boaz see you until he has finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down, then go and uncover his feet and lie down there. He will tell you what to do. I will do everything you say, Ruth replied. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. And after Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. And around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over, and he was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz exclaimed. You are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary, for everyone in town knows that you are a virtuous woman. 
But while it's true that I am one of your family redeemers, there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Stay here tonight, and in the morning I will talk to him. If he is willing to redeem, redeem you very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until the morning, but she got up before it was light enough for people to recognize each other. For Boaz had said, no one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. Then Boaz said to her, bring your cloak and spread it out. And he measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back. And then he returned to town. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, what happened, my daughter? And Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. And she added, he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said to her, just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. The man won't rest until he has settled things today. This really is an interesting turn of events in the story. God had provided for Naomi and Ruth, and he'd come through for them in amazing ways and above and beyond even what they had expected in providing for their needs and and even lifted their hopes again. Where there had been despair, he replaced it with hope again about what could happen. But from the end of chapter 2 and going into the beginning of chapter 3, there was kind of a new status quo that had settled in. They'd come, God provided for their basic needs, they had food, they had a place to stay, and it says that Ruth was living with Naomi, and and they were going along from day to day, kind of a new norm, a new status quo that had settled into place. And while they were hopeful in God's promise, the idea of a redeemer had come to their mind, they needed something more. They needed to take a step of faith. So how do we know? How do we know? Probably all of us have been there at times when we were in those desperate moments or realized, man, things just aren't changing. They're not getting any better. They're not getting different. It, it, we're, we're not getting anywhere. How do we know when to take a step of faith? And how do we know that it is, in fact, faith and not something else? Not that foolishness or presumption, not my own wishful thinking, not my own desires that I'm trying to manipulate, but that it's a step of faith in what God has desired. Now we see Ruth in this passage acting very much in a way that is trusting. I've talked to you, this is all about our relationship with God and trust, submission, and obedience. The first thing that we see in Ruth is an action of trusting, trusting. She and Naomi both actually. You know, it's at this point that the story seems to turn a little dicey, turn into a little bit of maybe risky business. It's a potentially scandalous situation, you know, as you read this and think about what's going on here. And that's what actually makes it a step of faith is that it is an act of trust. Now, as we read across that story, I'm not sure how some of that struck you. I've heard this presented in a way that made it seem or sound uh, a little sketchy. Uh, and a little sexual, you know, the sexual connotations of what was going on at the threshing floor that night as Ruth went and uncovered Boaz's feet, and she spends the night there. But I, I think in studying this, and as we'll see looking at Scripture against Scripture, that that's sensationalizing the story beyond what is there. Boaz himself comments that Ruth is known around the community as a virtuous woman. And Scripture is very plain that nothing inappropriate happened. She spent the night at his feet, not in his arms. And yet there's something risky here, and it is a potentially scandalous moment. That's why he says nobody needs to know that a woman was here tonight. And we don't want to besmirch her reputation in this. He's protecting and watching over her again. So still there was some risk and there was some uncertainty in what's happening. And can I suggest to you that when we do take a step of faith, when we step out in trusting God, the guarantees are not there. You know, we, we love a sure thing, don't we? We love a sure If there's a sure thing, I'm betting on it, you know. I, I want to be there for it. We love a sure thing. We don't like the risk and the uncertainty. But a step of faith requires a certain amount of risk and uncertainty about the outcomes. We don't know for certain. We don't see the beginning to the end the way that God does. We have to put our trust in Him. Now, they're doing this, they're acting in a trusting way before God in the spiritual of this. Naomi and Ruth are not presuming to push their own agenda. They are actually acting on God's promise, what he said, this idea of a redeemer. 
You know, we've talked about the hopelessness of their situation as there is no longer a male family member, one, to watch over them and protect them and provide for them, but no heir to take possession of the land and continue the family. And so they have this hope in the Redeemer that we've talked about, someone who would come back into that situation. And that's the thing that they're acting on. And sometimes it takes that moment of stepping out. It requires a step of faith. A step of faith is what sets the wheels in motion. I do not know exactly why. You know, anyone who would presume to say they understand God, I think, has taken a, a big step. You know, we, we don't understand the things that God does. There are some things about God that we can observe. And for whatever reason, this all-powerful, supreme, and sovereign God who is well able to make it all, can sustain it all, can do it all, who is not dependent on anyone or anything, chooses to limit himself in his activities, sometimes to the things that we pray for. God doesn't move until someone prays. He's clear in his word. He says, I looked for somebody to stand in the gap. I thought surely someone would step up and see the need and begin to pray and call on me to do something. He cho chooses to wait for that moment. And there are times that he chooses not to move until we act in obedience and faith on the things that he has promised. He chooses to. It's not that we are the important pivotal part or the linchpin or the doer or the accomplisher of something. It's that God has set that out there before us that I'm going to do this, but I'm going to wait until you take a step, until you're involved in this, until you're a part of the story, until you're a part of the action. And so a step of faith is what sets the wheels in motion. And we know that very true as well from, from teaching in the New Testament. You know, James chapter 2, James talks a lot about faith and action and how they go together. You know, and he and Paul are not in conflict even in talking about our sa salvation when Paul says, you know, uh, our salvation is of faith. It's not of works. It's not about the things we do. Of course not. We couldn't do it. Jesus did it. And it's given to us as a gift, and we accept and receive that gift that he's given to us, but we don't do it. And yet he says that in that, there is action that follows behind. And Paul even says that in that passage. He says, then we go on to the good works that we were created to do. And James says that, you know, when you have faith, you can't hide it. It doesn't disappear. It's not inactive. He says, you see the faith in somebody's life because they step out and act on it. It's real to them. It's become a part of their life. It's something that they do. And so stepping out in faith is what often sets the wheels in motion. Not that we accomplish something for ourselves, but that we're in partnership with God in a way that he has chosen. So Naomi and Ruth are stepping out on this promise that God has made. They've seen in, in chapter 2, we saw, you know, the, the spark of hope there. He's related to us. He's a potential redeemer. This could happen. God could be doing something. And so in time, nothing happens. They step out. They begin to act. And they're also exercising some trust not only in God in that spiritual sense, but in the natural. Naomi and Ruth are trusting in God's servant as well as in God. You know, they'd seen Boaz to be a righteous man and a faithful man. They'd seen him be very generous with them and going beyond even what God's word said, you know, to leave the grain at the edges of the field and not go back and pick up what was dropped. We saw in the last chapter, you know, Boaz is telling his workers, hey, pull out a few extra, you know, and drop them on the ground. And if she's over here gathering where she's not really supposed to be, said, don't embarrass her. You let her do whatever she needs to do. He's been generous, gave her roasted grain on top of what she was picking up. You know, he's, he's been a blessing to them. But but they are still yet putting some trust in him that he's going to respond to this well, for one, that he's going to do what needs to be done, that he's going to act in accordance with God's promise. As we'll see in just a moment, he actually has some choice about it. But they're trusting in him. The point in that I think that is relevant to us is that we sometimes may find ourselves in the situation of having to grow up a little bit in learning to trust our brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Now that's difficult. You know, trust is a whole difficult issue. When you start as a child and when you have a child, you know, I think the beauty of, of our kids and our grandkids as we play with them is they're incredibly trusting, aren't they? I mean, they believe in us. They trust us. They don't give it another thought. You know, you say, do this and they do it. You know, come to me, jump, whatever. They do it, you know. It's all, we learn not to trust. 
We learn not to trust by experiencing either people who weren't trustworthy or situations that didn't turn out well. You know, we get burned somewhere along the way and we learn not to trust. And as we grow to maturity, we learn that lesson all too well. And part of coming back into that right relationship with God and understanding that God is still sovereign over all and he ultimately is in control of my situation in spite of the fact that in this world he allows certain negative things to happen. There is a curse at work in this world that we live in that he's got our good in mind. And he says, you've got to trust me. Trust, submission, and obedience. Part of that is in learning to trust other people again. Because we can get really good at closing that up and saying, well, I trust God. You know, I'll pray, I'll give it to God. I'll, I trust God in that, but I'm not trusting anybody else. We need each other. We cannot function independently of each other. As proud and independent as we are as Americans, Alaskans, and all those other things, we are not an island unto ourselves. We need each other. We need the family. We need the body. And if we're going to engage with each other, we're going to have to open up and trust each other. Now, in a very practical sense, there are tons of people within the body of Christ, not necessarily just this household, but many households, who are going around with huge gaping wounds and hurts and needs in their life, and they don't get the support, they don't get the prayer, they don't get the encouragement, they don't get the assistance that they need. But the root cause of that is they are unwilling to trust enough to have even one person that they will share that with and allow to come into that situation and be there with them. Again, they may have good reason. Maybe they had an experience with somebody who wasn't trustworthy and someone who hurt them. But somewhere along the line, we have to trust again. And they're putting their trust in this man, Boaz, one of their brothers, just as they need to, just as we need to in this natural sense. And as a part of a family, we've got to learn to trust each other that way too. But this is part of that where this situation looks a little sketchy, and I've heard the connotations. She goes and, and she uncovers Boaz's feet. Now, I kind of wondered about that. Maybe you have too. Now, to me, I don't know how you are, but when I'm asleep at night, if you uncover my feet, that's probably what's going to help me wake up because I get cold, you know, all of a sudden. So I'm thinking, okay, she uncovered his feet so he'd wake up, you know. He's over at the end of the grain pile. He's eaten and, and drank, and he's down. And he's out for the count, you know. Uncover his feet, he wakes up. That's actually not what this is about. This is the part where some people have sensationalized, and then they said, well, this uncovering, you know, referred to something sexual. She uncovered, and she's crawling into bed with him and all of these things that are going on. No, that's not what this is about either. This actually goes back to the promise they were acting on, the promise of God that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. And this is actually the story about the man with one shoe. You know, I used to have a favorite movie years ago. It was a Tom Hanks movie about the man with one red shoe. You know, it, this could be that story, the man with one red shoe. You know, this is, this is it. This is where that idea is coming from. But if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 25, beginning in verse 5, here's where this promise comes from. It says, if two brothers are living together on the same property and one of them dies without a son, his widow may not be married to anyone from outside the family. Instead, her husband's brother should marry her and have intercourse with her, be a husband to her, and fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law in that way by taking her into his home. The first son that she bears to him will be considered the son of the dead man the dead brother, so that his name will not be forgotten in Israel, so that he has an heir, someone to carry on the family. But here's where this gets informative. If the man refuses to marry his brother's widow, she must go to the town gate and say to the elders assembled there, my husband's brother refuses to preserve his brother's name in Israel. He refuses to fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law by marrying me. The elders of the town will then summon him and talk with him. They'll bring some counsel to him. Hey, dude, what are you doing? What are you thinking? What's going on here? And they bring some counsel to him and talk with him. And if he still refuses and says, I don't want to marry her, the widow must walk over to him in the presence of the elders, pull his sandal from his foot, and spit in his face. And then she must declare, this is what happens to a man who refuses to provide his brother with children. Even afterward in Israel, his family will be referred to as the family of the man whose sandal was pulled off. 
the man with one red shoe. You know, this is the guy. You're going to be remembered. You just got a name out of this. This is the promise that's here. But this is something where we need to learn to look at Scripture together, too, while this story gets really sensational in some people's eyes. Ruth, by uncovering his feet, was saying, hey, are you going to do what the Word says you can do for me? Shoes are actually very important. I was doing research on this, and shoes in Israel are very important. I wasn't researching the Christian sites. I went to the Hebrew sites. I went to Kabad.com or something like that. I'm looking through these. Shoes are hugely important. And this whole idea of uncovering the feet, she was making the point of that. Hey, this is where the shoes go, and I'm uncovering your feet. Are you going to wear the shoes? Are you going to be the man? Are you going to do this thing that God has said can happen, or are you not? That was the point of uncovering his feet. And then she puts herself right there. I'm at your feet. I'm at your mercy. Either you'll do this or you won't because just as the word says, he has a choice. He can do it or he can say, I'm not doing it. Gets a name along with it, but he can do it. So that's where we find this. And where we find this act of faith and what's going on, an act of faith is an act of trust. Let me dial this back into our situation. If you're looking for an act of faith, and trying to decide if what you're doing and where you're trying to step out and where you're trying to do something, is what you're doing, is it an act of faith? Is it an act of trust? Is it an act of entrusting ourselves to God and what He has promised and being willing to step out and put ourselves on the line because of it? If it is, it's a good bet. It's a step of faith. A couple other things we're going to check to see. Trusting, then submitting. Submitting. Trusting and stepping out on God's promise is a good start, but it can be the very point actually at which we cease to continue to act in faith. And that may sound a little strange. But the initiation of that process may have been an act of faith, but the submitting may be the very area where we stop acting in faith in the middle of what we're doing. And the situation changes. Ruth was submitted to God. She submitted herself to Naomi, who gave her the instructions about what to do. She submitted herself to Boaz as she came and placed herself at his feet, waiting to see what was going on. But this can become the moment when we cease to act in faith because this is the point at which we become most tempted to try to manipulate the circumstances and the situation to what our desired outcome is. Okay? We do this in prayer all the time, don't we? Because we don't only pray about what we need, we pray about how we want God to answer it, right? God, I need you to do this so that my situation improves. Would you do this? And we can be very specific. It's not that it's bad to pray specifically. It's not even that it's bad to ask. But we can begin to try to manipulate circumstances to be what we think they need to be. And we probably all experience the fact that God doesn't always answer our prayers our way, does he? He doesn't do things the way we think they ought to be done. Oftentimes, most of the time, we can look back with hindsight and be like, wow, God, I'm really glad you didn't answer that the way I wanted you to because the way you did it worked out a whole lot better. But we usually have to look back at it to see that. But this is a situation where we have to really be submitted to God. And what that means is becoming vulnerable, not controlling Becoming vulnerable in that situation and not controlling. Accepting that there are variables in this circumstance and situation that are beyond my control. I can't engineer, manipulate, control this situation to be how I want it to be. There are variables beyond my control. But if I'm stepping out and trusting God and putting myself in His hands, I'm going to have to submit to the fact that God is going to bring this about in the right way, in the right time, in His way. And so what we then are desiring is an outcome, not the outcome. We're going to set ourselves up for frustration and problems in this when we have a defined outcome and says, God, I believe you're going to do it, and you're going to do it this way, and there's just no other way. It's got to be this. You can't put God in a box. He won't fit, for one, and I don't think he likes it on the other part. You know, we don't either, right? But you can't put God in the box, but that's what we want to do. We want to have him packaged up and contained real nice, and, and, you know, he's there to be my ace in the hole, and he's going to make this thing turn out great. Well, yeah, he's going to make it turn out great, but it's probably not going to look like what you thought it would look like. But as we're trusting God and asking for his help, are we submitted to the fact that if he really is God, then we really do want him to do it his way, because that's the best way. And allow him to be at work in it. 
So we're not looking for the outcome. We're looking for an outcome. God, I'm desperate for you to move. You've got to do something in this situation. I don't think I can go on another day with this the way it is. I need you to move. But I realize, God, I'm going to have to let go and let you do whatever it is you're going to do. That can be personally. That can also be as we pray for other people. Some of us who've had a close family member or a child or someone that we prayed for in their relationship, their journey with God, and they're resisting and they're struggling and they're battling against that, you know, there comes a time in praying for them that you have to let go, don't you? You have to let go and say, God, you've got to move in their life, and I'm just going to have to pray that whatever you need to do, whatever you have to do in their life, I just want to see them come to you. It's a little bit of a scary place because some of them will take a hard trip out of that, a hard journey. But we have to let go of it and trust that God is the one that's going to work that out in the right way. He's the one that's going to deal with that. It's becoming vulnerable and not controlling, but at the same time, that's not a bad thing. It's still becoming bold and courageous, not reluctant and passive. That doesn't mean I just step out of the situation and say, oh, well, you know, I guess it's going to be what it's going to be. We're not fatists. You know, we're not sitting back waiting and saying, well, whatever fate is, it's going to be. No, like I said before, God has chosen for whatever reason to involve us in the things that he does. He wants us to pray. He wants us to act on his word. He wants us to act in obedience to him. And he wants to be at work to do these things. But he wants us to engage in that partnership with him. We don't sit back and become passive. We don't check out and wait for the end. We don't become reluctant, but rather we become bold and courageous to do the things that we know we should do. The things that his word is clear about us doing. You know, she did her best to put her best front forward, right? Naomi was pretty savvy. She said, hey, I want you to go home, take a bath, put on some perfume, put on your best clothes, and here's what you do. Now, in one sense, as a guy, I look at that and I say, that's not fair. You know, that's kind of tilting the situation a little bit, right? Now, it's, it's not. She was doing the right thing. Guys, we do the same thing. If you're going to go for a job interview, what do you do? Get a haircut, take a shower, put on a nice suit, some nice clothes. You want to make a good impression, right? Same thing that's going on here. Not a sexual thing, but something that's going on here. She's putting her best foot forward. You know, here I am. I'm depending on a redeemer. She's already demonstrated her faithfulness to the family as she stayed with Naomi. She's been there helping her survive and all of that. She's saying, hey, I'm reaching out to you. I can't do this on my own. And there she is, putting her best forward. It was a very bold move on her part. It was a very courageous move on her part. You have to remember, this is not, you know, in the 2000s in America. This is in this time when a woman didn't take those kind of proactive steps, and especially in encountering or addressing a man. This was a bold, courageous step on her part to put herself out there and do that. She did still have to be an initiator in that situation to move it forward. She was acting on God's promise, but not a manipulator in the situation. She put it to him, and she was very plain about her request. When he woke up, she says, spread the corner of your garment over me, for you are my redeemer. There again, this is not a reference to the blanket and the bed. This is a reference to Ezekiel 47 that talks about God being the one who spreads his garment over us and saves and redeems us. And she said, put that covering of protection over me. Be my redeemer. You're the one that can do it. So an act of faith is an act of submission. While we proactively step out, we do not try to manipulate or control the outcome according to our own desires, our own motivations. We want God to move, but we want God to move His way. His way and in His time. Trusting, submitting, and last of all, obeying. Obeying. At the end of the stepping out and putting it all on the line, Ruth still wasn't sure what was going to happen. You notice the cliffhanger at the end of this chapter? Boaz says, hey, you're going to have to wait a minute because I'm, you know, I'm not the first in line, actually. You know, we can't necessarily make this work out the way you had thought it would. There's some other factors here that you didn't know, and you're going to have to to hang back on this. And she goes to Naomi, and Naomi says the same thing. At the end of all this, she was given the instruction I think all of us dread the most. Wait. Don't you hate to be told to Wait. Now, that's one of those things I guess never changes from the time we're kids, you know. You come in and you're like all excited and you want something and your mom says, wait. And you're like, 
you know, the wiggle starts because you just, you can't wait anymore and pretty soon you're asking again, you know, he's just, ah! and she's like, wait, you got to wait a minute, you know, mom's talking or dad's talking or this is going on or that, you're going to have to wait. We're the same way, I don't care how old you are, I don't care if you're in your 80s, we're the same way with our father in heaven. God, and we're all in the wiggle, you know, God, you got to do it now, and God's like, wait, you're going to have to wait a minute. I don't want to wait. I hate waiting. That's, you know, out of the answers we get in prayer, that's the one I dread the most, wait. I'd almost rather have him just say no as to tell me wait, you know, because I don't, I don't want to wait anymore. I want to see what it's going to be. But she gets those very instructions to wait. And where we find the obedience in her obedience to God and that same kind of obedience that we need to have is that she is, in fact, patiently waiting for direction. Boaz left her there. She put herself on the line. There she is. And Boaz responded very favorably. He's like, wow. He said, I'm so impressed with you. Not only have you loved your family enough to leave home and country and come and do all of this, but he's like, I'm the old dude, and you, you haven't gone off chasing some guy that was better looking or richer or whatever else. You're still trying to do the right thing. He's like, wow, this is an awesome woman. He's impressed. But he still had to say, you're going to have to wait. We got to do this the right way. He said, I'd love to, love to take you up on this offer, but there's somebody else in line. We've got to have a conversation. We've got to do this by the book. I've got to go to the gate, go through this process like we read about in Deuteronomy 25. You're going to have to wait. And so she goes home, and I think she was excited to tell Naomi about it, but I think she still had that same kind of thing. Oh, how do you think it went? What do you think is going to happen? What's next? Do you, do you think he really likes me? You know, is this going to work out? And she's like, you got to wait patiently. He's going to get this thing done, but you're going to have to wait patiently for direction. So she's patiently waiting, and she's also willingly and humbly accepting and receiving whatever comes. This is kind of back to that whole not manipulating it. Because if we're going to be obedient to God and we're going to put ourselves out there and say, God, I trust you. And if we're going to submit to God and say, okay, God, I realize you're going to do this your way, not my way. Then being obedient says that when God's answer does come down the line, we don't reject it. We don't puff up at it. We don't get mad at it and say, well, that's not the way I wanted it. You know, that's not what I was looking for. It says, God, I will wait for you. And whatever answer you provide is my answer. And I'll take it, and I'll act on it, and I'll go with it. You know, she's facing a possibility here for as much as she may have found herself attracted to Boaz, this man who'd been very kind to her and provided for her and let her work in those fields. With her, that may have been a very attractive possibility for her. Hey, he could be my redeemer, and this would be a great thing. And he says, there's, there's another. That'd strike a little fear in your heart, wouldn't it? Oh, man, I just put myself out here to marry somebody, and now I may get door number two. Anybody ever watch the dating game? You know, I'm not sure I want what's behind door number two. That wasn't what I had in mind, you know. Some of you are thinking I'm already married to what was behind door number two. I, I hear the giggles going on. I mean, what's what you're thinking in your head. But anyway, God is working this out, you know, but she's got to wait and see what the answer is. And she's okay with that. And so finally, we find that an act of faith is an act of obedience. Whatever instruction we receive, we follow. Whatever we receive, we accept. So whatever your situation is, if you're like, I think I need to take a step of faith. I think I've got to kind of step out there for God. These are some things we can do to kind of check ourselves and see where we're at. Am I trusting? Is this just something that came up out of my own head or do I have a promise of God? Or do I have something solid in the word of God that I can stand on and say, okay, God, I'm going to step out here and take you at your word. Will you do what you said you would do? Am I going to be submitted to that? Am I going to try to tell God how to do it? Or am I asking him to do it and realizing God's going to do his own thing? So in submission, that step of faith is, okay, God, do what you're going to do. And finally, am I obedient? When whatever I'm directed to do, whatever instruction I'm given, and whatever is given to me, will I take it for what it is and act in obedience in following him? And it's kind of interesting, in, in closing these out week to week, God's kind of brought the same question back to my mind, just to ask you as we close these out, where are you today? As a pastor, I do become aware kind of of some of the things going on in some of your lives. You know, I get invited in to pray with you, and I hear what's happening with you and things that are happening, but on the whole, I don't know that much about what's going on in your private lives. 
I'm not saying I want to, believe me. That's not an invitation in that sense. If you need me, I'm here for you. But, uh, but what's, where are you today? What are you dealing with? What's going on? Are you desperate for something to change? Are you longing for God to move? Perhaps the delay that you've been experiencing is not on God's part. It may be on ours. God may be waiting for us to take that step. God may be waiting on us to pray and ask him to fulfill what he said he would do. God may be waiting on us to take a step and act on what we already know from his word we should do in the situation. Is there a promise of God that you can hang your hopes on? Something in his word that you know you can hold on to. If so, is it time to take a step of faith? And just remember that a step of faith is rooted in God's word and his promise, and it's an act of trust, submission, and obedience. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to pray with you and over you, and then we're going to have some time to pray. The worship team's going to come back and lead us in another song of worship. And once I step down from here after praying, if you need specific prayer, if you need some counsel, if you want to be anointed with oil and prayed for, we have uh, folks that will meet you at either side. I'll be down here on one of the sides at the front. If you'll just come to either side of the front of the platform, we'll pray with you there. And we'll take as much time as you need. No rush, no hurry in any of that. We're here for that today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much. Lord, again, for the privilege to be in your house, the privilege to be with family, to be a part of your family, thank you for the way that you continue to love and, and minister to us. We come here, I think, thinking that we're ministering to you, you know, as we come in to sing your praises and, and pray and give in the offering and do the things that we do and all good things, and I hope that you are honored and pleased by those, but Lord, if we haven't learned it yet, we can't ever outgive you. Lord, you turn around and you give right back and you pour out blessings on us. And Lord, I just, I hope and I pray this morning that there's nobody in this room that's walked in with something burdensome in their life that they're going to try to turn around and walk right back out the door with. But God, I pray they're going to put it before you. I pray that you're going to spark hope in them again. Lord, that you take the broken situations in our life and you, you work it into something good. Lord, I pray that they're going to be inspired to take you at your word. I pray they're going to be encouraged to take a step of faith. And Lord, maybe that begins with just stepping out for prayer. And Lord, may we see the great things that you're doing, and may we not forget to give testimony and praise of the good things that you've done when they happen. But Lord, may all of our hope and our trust and our assurance be in you. Lord, if it's problems they're facing today, if the finances are tight and they're not sure what's going to happen next, Lord, if it's something in family and relationships and emotions, Lord, if it's something physical in their body, I pray that we're going to trust you with it. We're going to hold on to your word. We're going to stand on your promise. We're going to believe for you to do what only you can do. Father, if there's somebody that's come in this house today that does not know what it is to be in that right relationship with you, to receive that gift we talked about today, that's your grace to save us and bring us back into right relationship with you. Lord, that's what all of this is about. Each of us, by nature, chooses to go our own way, not trusting, submitting, and obeying you, and we walk away from that relationship, and we're lost from you in sin. The whole reason that Jesus came wasn't to teach us to be good people but to bring us back from death to life, to open the door for that relationship with you that we could step back into, find your grace and forgiveness, and learn to walk in trust and submission and obedience to you down the path that you have marked out for us. Lord, if there's someone here that hasn't stepped into that relationship today, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be pressing hard on their heart not to walk out that door without a change taking place. So, Lord, we put these things before you. I pray that in these moments, by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to your people. Challenge them. Lift them up. Encourage them. Remind them of your love, your mercy, your grace, and also your power. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.